That's nice. Good radiogram, GE. This is sort of one of the Rolls Royces of models. There's a big Scandinavian model, which is sort of the gold standard. These 60s ones certainly bring more than the earlier 40s and 50s ones. If someone's got one of these and they want to bring it here, but they don't have the ability to move something like this, what would you charge them to bring it to auction? We use contract carriers, so it just depends on what we're being billed. But we've got guys who just use a van who work at about 80 bucks an hour. So generally, unless it's a really good single piece, it's not always economical to move. But if you've got sort of half a dozen bits of furniture or, or a couple of good things, and we can certainly get it done. And what would you see something like this going for? It needs a little bit of polish. We haven't tested it, depending on how it tests when people try to play it. It's probably sort of a two to four hundred dollar piece in that condition, so needing a bit of love. Still be worth paying then to get it here. It just depends on your purpose. Yep. If you're trying to glean max funds, possibly not. But if it's in grandma's house, you want to get something out of it and it's the only thing that's worth selling, we could certainly tidy it up. Sure. Standard array of antique furniture. These used to be about 1500 bucks, and now it's probably going to be 100 I've actually seen a lot of auction houses aren't even getting bids on this sort of furniture. You have a good clearance rate, though, with a lot of your stuff. I guess when you pass items in, if they don't get a bid, what do you do with things that are getting uh, passed in? We very rarely have anything that doesn't get a bid. And because we work primarily unreserved, with something like this, we'd take whatever we can get. Yep. So if it's 30 bucks on the day, a lot of this stuff ends up going to our country and regional dealers because they still have a market for it. If for some reason we've got something like a decent lounge or something more contemporary that we just don't get interest in because there are too many examples or whatever in the sale, if we don't sell it, we'll just hold it back and re-offer it. But we clear in excess of 98% of the entire sale. We don't work on that. If we don't get the money, we'll put it out and try it again. If I've given people reasonable advice, we almost always hit within that zone. Yep. So this will all be gone at the end of the sale. How many days after the auction concludes do people have to pick up items that they win? So we ask for payment and collection by the end of the Monday following the auction. If there are extenuating circumstances, so long as we know about it, we can negotiate longer. But so long as it's paid for by the end of the Monday, we sort of need stuff out because we have limited space and we've always got stuff coming in behind it. So yep. this gets filled every fortnight, so we can't have big lumps of furniture lying around. Um, we've got three gophers in this sale, mobility scooters, reasonably late model ones from three different estates. So there's... There's definitely some money to be saved and probably money to be made on those. And that one, I would guess, is going to be sort of six to 800 Occasionally, we'll get two or 3000 for a late model one. But we've got three in this auction. A lot of white goods, I noticed as well. Uh, I've got a few in this sale. Sort of trying to cut back on the older stuff these days because the fall in price of the sort of supermarket brand white goods has meant that uh, stuff just doesn't bring any money. And the guys who deal in it, because they need to provide some type of warranty, don't want to take risk on anything that's more than about 7 or 12 years old. So we'll still get a, the odd, clean, older thing, which will be a $30 or $40 fridge. Um, to these will be sort of a few hundred. Um, a good array of clean, late model stuff in this sale. Actually, I've seen these. Tell me, why does some of these copper pots go for so much money? Uh, to begin with, they've got a reasonable amount of scrap in them. Um, copper by weight is expensive um, also because they're sort of decorative people like them for wood boxes or planters or whatever um, finding good clean ones is becoming more and more difficult obviously the days of people having them in their laundries are long gone do you think um, it makes much of a difference to price if someone spends the time to clean and polish them up versus selling them raw uh, not always um, it's like cast iron Sometimes you'll see them in the cast iron, a uh, wrought iron frame that make them more decorative. That certainly impacts the value. Um, would add some value, but I wouldn't say it would offset the amount of time it would take you, unless you've got a really well um, out workshop with buffing machines. If you do it in ten minutes, it'd be fine. But yep. there's a lot of polishing in a copper. Nice lounge. Would that make a difference being green to say black as far as the price is concerned? Uh, depend on who likes it. Um, and brown generally are the best sellers. Um, they fit into a variety of decors and they're also more forgiving if they're worn. Um, this is very much of its period. I'm imagining this was bought in the 80s. 
So the green may, it's probably old enough that some of the uh, sort of vintage and retro decorators may pick up on it. One reason I love using auction houses is because it gives you the ability to be able to buy more items than what you would be able to if you were just solely an eBay seller. Lots like this where you can pick up bargains at garage sales and put them in auction <coughs> might not be viable if you're only an eBay seller. I notice with your auction, you take one photo per listing, whereas some like eBay lots, they do 10 photos. Do you think it makes a difference to the final value when there's one photo versus, say, multiple with doors and drawers and what have you being opened? Uh, it can. If we've got things that we think will be substantially impacted, we do, for some lots, uh, multiple images. For the sort of bay and shelf lot stuff, we tend to find that the buyers who are interested in them will either give us a call if they want additional images or most of this goes to people who've come into the room and inspected. So the sort of additional benefit from the amount of time associated with multiple photos, um, particularly justified from our end, um, always send images, answer questions if people have got questions. So that is something you would do if, if someone yeah, saw if a listing on your... If someone sees it yep. and they want to know what's in a box, all they need to do is email us or ring us. Yep. Um, auction day, uh, viewing day... I'm always here and Sam and I generally just MMS your images. Um, that way you're getting them straight to your phone. Yep. If you need extras, that's we'll always do it. I guess a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know that it's an option for them. So that's good. What other items do you have this week that are um, going to be highlight, do you think? Uh, got sort of 250 or 300 grams worth of rings and bracelets. That's a lot. Is that normal for you guys here or is that more than what you normally no, get? No, it's more than what we'd usually get. We hit one estate that um, quite a large quantity and then we've had a couple of other jobs that have had sort of moderate amounts. So we've just ended up with more than we usually would. Through here, this is a particularly good bit of South Australian pottery by Bosley um, Mitchum. It's a water monkey, so a drinking water vessel, large size very nicely marked. Um, their product isn't always stamped, um, but they were well-known potters in the 30s. Um, they used to make garden ornaments, gnomes, birds, fish. Is, is this Bosley? That's Bosley, yeah, yep. frogs. So he's um, is typical. They tend to be a bit chippy. Um, they've lived outside. That one, again, nicely stamped. Um, not always stamped, but the uh, collectible, um, probably the peak is they did uh, to display Freddo frogs, big yellow belly frogs with McRobertson's Freddo on the belly. Oh, they go for about 2000 I think, don't they, the Freddo ones? Or? The, uh, a good Freddo should bring 10. 10000 Yeah. Um, the gnomes, I know another auction house had a whistling boy that bought 4000 last week. Um, he used to have a collection. I had about six or seven of them. Um, when we were looking at buying our first house, my wife said, you haven't saved anything, I've saved all this money. I was like, just leave me alone. So I took a trip and saw Marvin Hernell in Melbourne, who used to be the biggest dealer in such things, and um, came back with four post-dated checks, which became our first house deposit. Wow. And I'm pretty sure the real estate went up faster than the Bosley ever did. Yeah. So. Given that it was an SA potter, do people interstate also collect Bosley? Or is uh, it all SA it's, it's largely an SA thing. The animals, the gnomes and things certainly have a national market. Um, they are a really uh, singularly unusual piece of Australian product. And the McRobertsons uh, display pieces they have a national market because I believe they use them right around the country. Um, and in terms of things still in use, um, still do see things being used commercially. There's a, a daffodil bulb supplier who is often at the uh, Royal Adelaide show with their bulbs and they've got a full set of green Bosley daffodil vases that they still display their flowers in to this day and they would have bought them in the 30s. I notice you've got like a 19th century trophy here. Is that one of the only things that you would recommend as far as silver plated style um, cutlery and things? Most of them don't sell, but trophies do. Uh, that one is good because it's a 19th century Australian trophy. Um, uh, and I think a Victorian jockey club. And it's got marks from uh, Steiner, who were one of the best colonial silversmiths, although that is a piece of silver plate. Um, you know, some plated things will sell. Um, a bit of that coal scuttle, uh, sugar scuttle is um, designed by Christopher Dresser, uh, was quite a known 19th century um, 
modernist designer all sorts of things so that's probably about a hundred bucks um unusual bits of silver plate um bits of deco good sort of early mid 20th century things can sell um things like you know 1920s tea sets or whatever will always be generally shelf lots i see that sterling sewer that is sterling sewer a teapot like this what would you estimate something like that go for um often not a lot more than scrap um that i think has got about 500 dollars worth of scrap in it um we offered last sale and that is one of the few things that we didn't sell so we'll give it another run this week and uh, see how it goes i actually didn't realize i tried selling some silver jewelry to cash converters they pay 25 cents a gram as a buyer of silver myself, I've been paying a dollar a gram. Dollar a gram, a dollar a gram scrap, yeah. pretty much. So yeah, cash converters are obviously um, the business keep, of making keep, money, keeping their margin yeah. tight. Yeah, I think um, I've been paying too much. So yeah, games <laughs> compendium. So that's uh, George the Third, probably sort of just nudging eighteen hundred um, mahogany with rosewood and I'm assuming satinwood. I'm not sure what the lighter color timber is. Um, and it's a multi-function board, depending on what game you're playing. You can drop the sleeve out of it and increase the number of squares. Um, that should be a couple of hundred. But yeah, there are a few interesting things. Um, so not stand out. Your jewellery, um, you tend to get a lot more than scrap value with the gold? Uh, at the moment, we're generally getting a little bit more than scrap. But often, scrap price or near is where it'll end. Um, exceptions are particularly decorative bits of antique jewellery so if you've got things like um, balls or lockets really decorative wearable things they can do better than scrap um, jewellery with decent sized stones in it so you're starting to look at the value of the diamonds or whatever gems are in them um, if you're talking wedding bands or you know, brooches you know, probably about the money and what would you say that the biggest buyer of your gold would be would it be a jeweler would it be a second hand dealer would it be? most of them would be online on sellers yep so um benefit of jewelry is that it's identifiable it is from the marks it's easy to clean up it's valuable small and very easy to ship so um once you have a good understanding of of what jewelry is um sort of basic ins and outs of it it's quite an easy thing to sell online um you may not move quickly but you can have a big inventory that is stored in a small space. And then when someone buys it, it's the easiest thing in the world to ship. And as an auction house, what's your commission rate for a buyer who was going to buy any of the gold jewellery? So uh, our premium is 16.5. Yep. So, so the hammer price plus 16.5%. So I guess as a reseller that would buy your gold ring, say if they bought it for scrap, it's plus 17%. Yeah. And if they were then to sell it, say on eBay, they'd pay another 12%. Yeah. They've just got to take that into consideration. So if, for example, you've got a scrap gold ring, what would the retail value on a typical style ring be? What would the profit margin be for someone who wanted to resell something like that? Uh, look, depending on what it is, um, I don't resell on eBay, but I would imagine most of our customers would be looking at sort of 100 percent yep 50 to 100 percent um is that before or after fees uh i would have thought 100 percent before fees but i'm entirely speculating you would know more about that than i danny no i was just that's, curious that's, <laughs> that's your end of the market um it depends what it is it depends on how decorative it is it really comes down to what you think you can get um if you find something that has a specific design style or is particularly pretty and you think you can make more money out of it well there's a bigger margin. Yep. In this week's auction, what do you think the most valuable, take the jewellery aside, because obviously you've got that tucked away, what do you think the most expensive item that would be in your catalogue this coming auction? Uh, either be, I don't know what we've got in here. Um, taking the jewellery out, it'll probably be some of the machinery that we've got outside. Um, we've got a couple of bits outside. We've got a camper trailer, which should be a couple of grand. Uh, we've got a drifter camper trailer, um, which is a good sort of uh, level. You can tow it with a standard sedan, not too heavy. Um, it appears to be in good neck. We've popped the top. All the canvas is good. So that should be a couple of thousand, I would have thought. And then we've got uh, heavy duty metal working equipment. So high mount lathe. Um, I would have thought that'll be sort of 1500 to two and a half. Um, and the machine next to it should be thousand to two thousand as well so did this come from an estate uh yeah these are an estate so all the stuff you can see down the side 
the compressors, the lathes, the two mills, all from the same estate. And so you just get the uh, contractor to charge the estate themselves, or does that is that uh, one we, process that we, you guys offer? If we or we can organise transport and lift. Um, and we then just deduct the cost as a fee from your vendor uh, proceeds. So if we're dealing with an estate, we can organise packing, boxing up, um, getting the supported to us, and we will deduct the fees from your proceeds. So there's nothing up front. Depend on the value of the, the estate as to whether we could debit that from um, sale of goods or whether we'd have the contract to build the estate direct for that. Um, these we didn't organise transport on. They've come in through... One of the house organisers, we deal with a number of the people who will charge you to do your downsize assistance. Um, so one of those uh, companies has the removal as part of their relocation service for the client. Will this lathe be sold with the tools as one? Yeah, lot? so we'll sell it with the tools and all the lathe heads. Do you think it would fetch a better price if you, say, did the tools separate to the lathe or just... Uh, often if wood carving chisels, I haven't been through there yet. If there's any, there's only a few chisels. If there was more, we'd probably split them off. The bits, the heads and things. Um, we always leave with the piece of equipment. Um, because whoever buys it is going to want them. Um, occasionally, if you know if hand tools associated that are standalone, we can split them off. Um, but this is all very much um, associated with the lathe. Specialising in, uh, if you've decided to specialise in antique furniture or decorative arts or whatever, that you maybe don't want the big, dirty, heavy, difficult to move thing in your room. Um, we have attempted to provide a very broad clearance service. We could have the best teak sideboard in the city and get, you know, three thousand dollars, or get two and a half or three thousand dollars for a bit of workshop um, equipment. At the end of the day, the commission is the same. Um, so these, we've, I've advertised these on Marketplace. I think they've had um, six hundred clicks, which is indication of the demand for such things. So, you know, if we can lay our hands on them and put them together and sell them, it's all calm and that's what we're here for. And I guess that's, you know, another reason I love dealing with auction houses, particularly uh, in a clearance house like yourself that'll take everything. I sold one of these recently for a mate whose father passed and I had to field over 200 inquiries, had multiple people inspect. It's the time that it takes yeah. to sell each one of these individual items you take it all to auction, it all sells in one hit, you get your money. Is it two weeks after things yep. sell? Yeah, so uh, Monday following the subsequent auction, because we only close off our books, there's always unsolds and things that people haven't collected. So we wait right up until the next auction to, to close the book uh, and then we direct deposit or post out the Monday following the next auction. Um, you can pick up funds from the next auction day. Uh, but yeah, it does make it easy. Um, the benefit of these is that these are a high quality, well maintained machine. So anyone who's looking, there would be nothing to deter them from purchase. Um, and because the whole lot in one place, hopefully we'll get um, a good number of people through to have a look. Um, I think the last larger lathe like this that we sold, we got three and a half thousand for, and it um, ended up Roxby down. Wow. And you wouldn't imagine something like that would be an easy sell, but they must be. Well, you know, they're, they're well-made, expensive things to replace. Um, if they get bigger, they become harder to sell. Often they end up getting scrapped because finding someone who A, needs them and B, is prepared to move them uh, is very, very difficult. There's a couple of reproduction mid-century bits. They're sort of um, older map pieces that came from a house, but they should still bring a few hundred. One um, thing I can't actually, I don't know why, the South Australian market tends to get a lot more uh, higher prices for furniture and even electronics than what uh, New South Wales and, and Queensland. Is there any particular reason why you think that the SA market spends more on the sorts of items that sell through here than what sort of brings uh, in the cheap? I don't know. Um, could just be a mentality thing and, and the number of second-hand dealers. Um, I did work in Perth for a number of years and they used to get, and I believe still do, get more money than you would expect, partially because uh, it was a small settlement that didn't expand until sort of post-World War II. So there wasn't a lot of older product available. So when it comes up, they seem to pay a lot of money for it. Um, 
but yeah, we supply a lot of regional centres. It could just be that with the scale of cities on the eastern seaboard, <laughs> it's harder for people to run general second-hand businesses. Um, whereas in South Australia, sort of transport's easier, access is easier. Um, yeah, but I, I couldn't tell you for sure. Uh, retro bar lot, what do you think that something like that would go for? That's um, quite desirable. Hit hit and miss um, because they're everyone likes them, but you've got to have room for them. Um, probably sort of one to 200 for a good teak front of one like that. Occasionally we'll get three or 400 for one, um, but they're not the easiest thing to hit top money for. What particular estate items do you think do particularly well? Um, so if you're going to an estate and someone wants you to take everything, what value would it need to be viable for you to offer that service? Uh, it depends on what the mix is within it um, and what the value of the furniture is. We won't always take everything. Occasionally we'll walk in and go, well, there's you know four bits of furniture that's saleable, the rest of it's really not but there's value in the small things. So we'll just get a van out to pick up the couple of better bits and the small stuff. Sometimes I'll walk through and say, just donate all the furniture and drop these three boxes of stuff off to us because you'll make more money by doing that than if we move the whole lot. I actually found it extremely difficult to donate. Who do you recommend people donate to now? Who's taking the donations? Uh, we don't donate much at all ourselves anymore just because we find we sell it all. We used to deal with the salvos. Um, but uh, Salvos, St Vincent de Paul have the biggest truck fleets. Um, the Refugee Association are proactive. Often if you're in an area where there's a, uh, a local rotary group, they tend to be quite proactive in terms of removing stuff because, you know, they're retirees and a bit of time and they're, they're motivated. Um, the big jobs that we do, we use contractors who are also doing rubbish removal and they have identified sort of various op shops town that will perhaps take um, lesser quality or bulkier items than some of the big charities. What are some of the misconceptions do you think that people have about selling at auction? Uh, probably the one of them is, you know, I'll get nothing at auction. We sold over $100,000 worth of stock in our last auction. Um, so clearly something was worth something. Um, that's, but, that's good. Good going. $100,000 uh, worth of stock via auction. Um, the, but, and even if you think, if they're desirable and valuable, if you put them into a competitive environment, you'll often get more than our commission in addition for them. Um, I think in your last video, you filmed a whole lot of guitars that we had. Yeah, yeah. What did we, they fetch? Uh, there was about $20,000. That's good. So they had probably 120, 150 people view them and then probably 30 or 40 people in the room for the sale as well as online. They would never be able to achieve that price trying to sell them privately. Because there was volume and there was some quality, we just advertised that on all the guitar trading forums, everyone turned up and then their emotion and competition kicks in. Um, so there were a lot of gritted teeth and glinty eyes as people had the prices run over the top of them in the room uh, and some very disappointed people leaving but that's an indication of the fact that we did our job properly and they bought what they should bring. And I guess that's probably one of the advantages you guys have here. I mean, how many years have you had this auction house? Uh, 24, I think. It, it's bizarre because, I mean, I've sold a lot of guitars over the years through different auction houses when I was interstate as well. And, you know, market value on a $3,000 guitar, I was only getting sort of four, 500 via auction just because the auction that I was using, and this is why I recommend you to anyone I deal with, is you get great prices, you advertise specific items and you go out of your way to do that. Like you just mentioned with the guitars, you advertised on Facebook guitar specialist groups and pages to showcase what was coming up and you bring the buyers. Other auction houses don't necessarily do that with a lot of the items and they slip under the radar and people don't know they're available. Well, we can't, we can't do it with everything, but certainly when, um, if we have a quantity of things that are, are of specialty interest, it's in my interest to do a little bit of, of work. There was one auction house that I sold a bunch of gold. I had a bracelet actually sold at an auction, but the the item broke, it was a bangle and it broke during inspection. So when the person bought it and went to pick it up, um, they obviously refused to take that because it was broken. The auction house gave it back to me broken and I was out obviously the value of the item. Have you had anything like that happen here? And what, what's the resolution if something does get broken? Um, if something gets broken and it's our issue and it's of significant value, then we'll have a discussion with the vendor and 
pay for it. If we break it after we've sold it, um, then I'll just pay out on what we sold it for. Yeah. There's just so many advantages to, to working with you at the auction rooms. I've been doing this for about 20 years and there's just no shortage of stuff. Never any shortage of so stuff. So who keeps buying it? I don't understand how it just I, keeps circulating. I, I, I don't know. I don't care, Benny. <laughs> If, this, if we stop and stop selling stuff, then I've got to find something else to do. Um, I don't know, it just keeps going around in circles. We had a whole lot of paintings in the last sale, uh, Hermansburg watercolours, and I was booking one of them in and flipped over the back. And I used to work for a company called Adelaide Antique Auctions in Kent Town, which ceased trading 25 years ago. And there was a vendor booking sticker, Adelaide Antique Auctions sticker on the back with my handwriting. Isn't so that funny? things go around and that sticker's been on there for 25 years. And only a month ago, I sold an item at another auction house about five or six years ago. And I was at an estate and I bought the item and it still had my vendor number sticker on the item. One other question before I let you go. The biggest declining category in your mind over the last, say, two years that you see continuing to decline? Um. Certainly antique and sort of 1930s, you know, everyday furniture uh, is getting to the point where it's some of it's not worth transporting, certainly anything that needs work. Antique glass in China still sort of waxes and wanes a bit, but definitely, you know, 1940s bedroom suites, um, cane-sided lounge suites, things that once upon a time were highly sought after, you just can't give away. All right. Well, thanks for your time, Lockie. I guess we'll um, I'll have more questions for you next next time. And anyone watching this video, if you've got any questions, leave them in the comments below and I'll uh, propose them to Lachlan next time I see him.